So um, in today's lecture, we'll finish off about the whole topic of sequential circuit state machines. Um, and this is how we will conclude everything we need to know about state machines. Uh, there will be a few topics in today's lecture. I will start with briefly talking about um, state assignments. Uh, how do you um, give good um, state codings or binary codings once you have your state in their alphabetical names? Um, then we'll go to another topic about state minimization, meaning if you just develop a state machine, how do you um, minimize it to have the least amount of states possible? If you had redundant states, how do you detect them? And then um, that's the second topic. The third topic, I will introduce to you two new flip-flop types, the JK flip-flop and the T flip-flop, and we will um, see well, what their characteristics are, how to work with them, how do we design with them, and how do we analyze circuits that use them. So that's everything on the agenda today. Uh, we'll start off with state coding. Now, in last week's um, lecture, we developed a state machine, and if you remember, it, has four, it had four states, A, B, C, and D, and we said that we need to assign some binary coding uh, for these state names in order to go into the sort of engineering domain and start actually developing a machine for them. Now in last week's lecture I gave you a few options. I said, well, you can give them counting order, just a binary counting. You can give them gray code matter coding. You can use what's called a one-hot coding. Um, and any of them will give you, you know, different state machines. Now it's important to realize that depending on the coding that you choose, you will get different combination of logic that will feed into the flip-flops. So the idea is that you want to come up with the best coding possible that will give you the smallest or the fastest or the less power hungry or whatever criteria you want um, um, in terms of the combination of logic. You don't want something bombastic to do something uh, quite small. Now, um, the best or the only way to really uh, find the best one is to actually try all of them. Now, we said there's actually infinitely many state codings that you can um, assign for the state names that you have because you don't, you're not restricted to the minimum number of flip-flops. You can um, come up with state machines that use more flip-flops than needed, uh, but usually you, you wouldn't want to do that. But in order to figure out what's the best circuit, you do need to try them all. Now, Trying them all is a lot of work for, you know, infinitely many, even for students. Um, so we came up with some rules of thumb that will give us good indications to how we can come up with um, good state assignments. Now what I will show you here is um, the first and the simplest rule of thumb to, um, to assign codes for states. There are a few more rules of thumbs that will sort of go up in complexity. And the more complexity your rule, the more complex your rules are, chances are you will end up with better assignments. These usually apply for larger machines that really have a lot of states um, that do need every minimization possible. Uh, but usually in real world, we don't apply those rules by hand. We don't take this gigantic state machine and try to find all the possible or the best combinations. We usually, we usually let um, our CAD tools or our computer try to figure out the assignments for us. And even the computers don't actually try all the possible combinations. The computer uses um, those rules of thumb um, a little bit more extensive than what we can do. I mean, we'll come up or we'll try, try to come up with the best possible solution. So the idea behind the rule of thumb that I'm going to show you is that we want to minimize the number of bit changes between any two adjacent states. So for example, have a look at this particular um, state table. It has one input and therefore uh, two transitions, two next states from each possible state. The idea is that I want to assign uh, state codes such that if I transition to B, I only have minimum number of bit changes between the assignment for A and the assignment for B, and similar minimum between A and C. And I will try to do it for all um, the state transitions that I have here. Now, the best case scenario is that I will only have one bit change between any two um, state transitions. 
but it's not always possible as we'll see in the example now. Now to do to come up with um, a good state assignments, I will use a table that looks like a corner map. Now the idea behind a corner map is that any two adjacent squares always differ by one bit. So once I put my state names into this map here, if they sit next to each other, and next to each other can be either to the right, to the left, um, top and bottom, um, then the state assignment will only be one bit different. So let me start by um, plugging in the first state A. Now I can go with any assignment that I want, there's no restriction. Usually, the first state is usually the initial state and we usually um, assign 0, 0, 0 to it because um, it's easy to reset flip-flops into a zero condition. Um, by the way, something I thought was pretty obvious, we have six states here. This implies a minimum of three flip-flops and I will use three flip-flops for it. Therefore, um, this corner map lookalike map will have three um, variables in it. So I will assign A to 0, 0, 0, and the way I will read this assignment is um, 0, 0, 0. And similarly, if I had something here, this would be a 1, 1, 1 assignment. Now I know that this um, A, I'm looking at the table, it will either go to B or C, and I want them to be as close as possible to A. So I will put B on the right hand side, and I will put C on the left hand side and remember corner maps wrap around so this is in fact near A. There's no limitation why I couldn't put C underneath A. That would still be uh, one bit change but you know I had to make a choice I choose this one here. Then I'll try to apply the same idea to the rest of the states. Looking at state B, well, it will either go to itself which means no B changes at all or it will go to state E. So I want to put E somewhere close to B. Um, let's say we'll put it underneath B. So again, one bit change in the state assignment here. State C, which is already on the map, will go to state F um, in both cases. I want to put F close to C. I will put it here. And again, I could have just as well put it here. Um, state D needs to go to state E and F. Now E and F are in fact already on my map and if I want to have a nice one bit change between D and either of them I will just put D in the middle. Now as for E and F they are already on the map because I put them there when I looked at the states. Let's see if what's already on the map actually works well for me. E needs to go to either D or B, hopefully in one bit change. Well, it goes to D and it goes, goes to B, one bit change, no problem. F needs to go to D or A, so F goes to D, one bit change. As for A, there's two bit changes. Because I need to go up and across, or across and up. And I didn't manage to um, have it in one bit change, but I tried. Now, as I said, the thing, the, the places where I put those states were, um, in a way, was an attempt. Maybe there's a better way to do it that will actually minimize everything, including this F2A. Maybe there isn't. I need to um, try it out. I don't particularly want to try it out. I think this will be good enough for me. Um, and then I can look at this map and start writing what are the state assignments from this map here. So I read it that A will be 0, 0, 0, B is 0, 1, 0, and so on. So I end up, and I do want to write it because later I will need to use those assignments, have it written down somewhere. So A is 0, 0, 0, B 0, 1, 0, C is one one zero. Sorry, one zero zero. D will be one one one. E zero one one. And F one zero one.
Now, kind of obvious, although maybe I should state it, that there was no real reason why I had to start reading the most significant bit from here. I could have just as well made this the most significant bit and then these the two least significant bits. I will have ended up with different coatings, but the idea that I have minimal uh, bit changes between any two states will still remain. Um, although the different coding will give me a different circuit, which one's the better one? Well, try them both. Again, this is not an absolute system. It's a rule of thumb with, that will usually give you a better circuit than just applying random state assignments. All right. Um, there's, as I said, there's more rules that you can apply to get better state assignments. I don't want to particularly talk about them anymore. Um, we'll just leave it at that for now. Any questions? So we go to the next topic I wanted to introduce to you today, and that's state minimization. The idea behind state minimization is that, if you remember last week when we designed a state machine, I said, don't be afraid to open new states. If you're trying to build a state machine and you're defining um, your states and you're writing your English description, and you want to figure out whether um, the next state for something you're designing should be something new or is it something that's already exists in your machine that you can just go back to it. Now you look at your machine, you look at the descriptions and you can't quite identify something that will match your case and then you go and you open a new state. What happens if it turns out that um, this state is in fact equivalent to another state and you didn't really have to open this new state? Well, if you just left it as you know, as your machine, you would possibly end up with more flip-flops, more states, maybe more complexity. Um, but if you identified this equivalency, then you could have minimized um, your flip-flops and your um, combinational circuit. Now, what I will show you now is a nice algorithm. And, you know, when you hear the word algorithm, it's always equivalent to no brains required because you just follow the procedure. You don't have to think too much. Um, but you do need to understand the algorithm, how to, um, how to work with it. Now, the idea behind combining states, do I have it written down? No, so I'll just tell you about it. The idea when we're combining states is to find um, equivalent states, and an equivalent state will be defined as a state that for all the different input combinations you can apply to it, it will go to the same next states and will output the same outputs for those input combinations. Uh, I'll show you an example if it's a bit um, uh, there in the air. Now, what happens in the case where it doesn't go, two states might go to separate um, states on the same input, so they don't look like they're equivalent. But if those two separate states that they go to are equivalent themselves, then the original two are equivalent as well. Let's, let, me, let me show you some examples on this um, state machine here. In this case, in the, in the example that we'll show you, we will work with a mealing machine. Um, but the same rules apply for, for a Moore machine with a slight change. So we have some random state table. Um, I don't actually know what it does. It's got seven states. Seven states imply how many flip-flops? Three? Twelve? <laughs> um, did I just hear voices? So. Uh, minimum of three flip-flops. Maybe if we can minimize and combine a few of those states together, maybe if we make it down to four states or less, we can um, get away with two flip-flops, maybe even one flip-flop if we can get, you know, two states at most. Let's see what we can do. Now, um, let me let you consider a um, few states just to see what's going on. Have a look at, for example, state A and state D.
Well, they might be equivalent. If you look at their next states, both of them go to either B on input 0 or to A on input 1. Both of them will output 0 for input 0 and will output 0 um, for input 1. Essentially, they have a very similar behavior to each other. So what um, makes them any different? Why are we going to one or the other if, the be if their behavior as a state is the same? So this is a very good um, candidate state to be combined together, A and D. And we sort of can look at it and say, oh yeah, A and D are uh, very similar. We should combine them together. Now, let's have a look at states. Let's stay with A. How about A and B? whether they can be equivalent. Well, they both go to different next states. And more than that, they don't have the same outputs. So here and here, we will get the same output, 0. But if the input is 1, we'll get two separate outputs from these states. That already contradicts the fact that they could be equivalent to each other. Because we cannot replace them with each other. One does one thing. The other one does a whole different thing. So we can right there and there say, well, A and B are not equivalent uh, for sure. What about A and C? Well, they got the same outputs. Um, it's 0 for x equals 0, and it's 0 for x equals 1. So no contradiction on the output front. What about the next states? Well, A goes to B, C goes to D on x equals 0. Not quite the same next state. Here, um, A goes to A, C goes to B. Now, let's have a look at these two. What if B and D were, in fact, equivalent to each other? If B and D were equivalent to each other, then the original two states that we looked at would have went to the same next state, which would have made them um, similar or equivalent to each other. Similarly, if um, A and B were equivalent to each other, then on x equals 1, we would have went to the next same state. But we already considered A and B before. And we said that they couldn't be equivalent because we had this um, contradiction in output. Therefore, A and B could not be um, identical. And therefore, A and C could not either be equivalent because they must go to two different states that cannot be equivalent to each other. And this is when you start getting that circular reasoning of, you know, if this is depending on this being equivalent, but this depends on this being equivalent, then how far do you go be before you go, oh, I'm too confused, screw that. Next exam question. Um, and this is, why, this is why I want to introduce to you the algorithm that will actually do it for you. Now, the idea behind this algorithm is to come up with a table or half a table that have in it all the possible um, state combinations that we can have. So each square corresponds to a state combination. And what we will do is uh, we'll go one by one of the, over um, these squares and test whether these two um, states combinations could, in fact, be equivalent. Now, it's going to be a slightly, not a slightly, it will be an iterative protocol uh, algorithm, iterative algorithm, that will resolve that circular reasoning. Uh, we will start off with saying, which states could definitely not be equivalent. And we will say which state might be equivalent if those other states were equivalent as well. And then we'll start taking it from there and saying, oh, but these we know could not be equivalent. Therefore, these could not be equivalent. Um, and we'll start crossing things out. Whatever's going to be left on our table is what's going to be equivalent to each other. Now, it's actually a very simple algorithm. Um, it's a little bit time consuming. Now, as I always do, I will go through it um, sort of, I'll start fairly slow. I will start rushing it afterwards. Um, I always have 
a dilemma when I do things like this in lectures. Um, and when I say things like this, it's either those kind of algorithms, filling up um, Karna maps, filling up truth tables. Because, you know, after a couple of entries, some people just get the idea and then they start sighing. And you start hearing, ah, oh, not that again. Other people um, in the theater actually um, are tuned in all the way through because they're not uh, quite in what's going on. I try to get some opinions. I, I went to students, I, I said, do you want to go quicker, do you want to go slower? And the problem is that there's quite a different mix of um, opinions about this one. Um, and therefore I decided I will keep the fairly um, slower pace on this one. Those who understand it are free to tune out. Please don't sigh. <laughs> just, just tune out, pretend like you're looking at this. Um, although I will start, you know, going through the algorithm slowly and I will, once we sort of get the idea, brush it up a bit. So, the algorithm starts, by the way, can everyone see why the table is built the way it is? So a few points I want to make here. Um, in this column here, there's no um, A state because then I would have a state um, equivalence for A and A and they're, well, obviously equivalent. Similarly, I don't have a state G in this row here because this will give me um, the G and G equivalents, which are equivalent. Um, and another thing is that it's sort of half a table rather than a full table because the other half will just give, the, give me a duplicate of what I already have here. So this table itself will give me um, all the information I need and it does have all the pairs of all the states possible. So we'll start off by um, checking which states are definitely not equivalent um, that I can tell straight away. Now the easiest way to determine that two states are not equivalent is to look at their outputs. If their outputs are not the same for all the different input combinations, if there's at least one output that differs, that means that those two states cannot be the same. Um, and I do need to go on sort of on a um, state pair by state pair um, basis, but it doesn't take as long. You start with sort of A and B. You see that they agree here, they don't agree here. Once we know that two states cannot be equivalent to each other, we'll just put a big cross um, in this square. And this will tell us um, these are definitely not equivalent. So we're looking at A. Now A needs to have on X equals zero a zero output um, on x equals zero. And we can see that all of them actually do have x equals zero. Oh, sorry, um, z, the output equals zero for this case. So we're actually pretty good on this front. But here we want the output to be zero where some of them have output ones. And these are the states that cannot be equivalent. So I already crossed out b all the other ones are potentials, I will cross out A and E as well. So this goes. Now A and C, A and D, A, F and A, G are potential um, equivalent. We don't know yet if they will be equivalent, but we do know that those crossed out definitely not equivalent. If you look at B, again we want um, the output to be zero here, all of them agree. We want the outputs to be 1 on this um, when x equals 1. And there's really only one state that agrees with it, which is state E. Meaning all the others could not be equivalent to state B. Again, for the reason that they don't have um, matching outputs for all the input combinations. State C have 0 and 0 at, it out, at, it, at its outputs. And only state E actually contradicts it. So C and E could not be equivalent. All the others could be. When I look at D in comparison to the rest of them, and the nice thing about this table is that once you're at the state, you really only go down to check um, the ones underneath it. So this will sort of, you know, getting smaller and smaller. Uh, D needs a zero, zero, which doesn't agree with E, but does agree with F and G. E doesn't agree with either F or G. 
And then the last one, F and G, well, they do agree on their output, their potentials. So that's the first iteration. It does not mean that all the ones that are left blank are now equivalent. Um, they may be. Now, what does that depend on? It depends on what next states combinations they have. For example, uh, when I said considered before, we looked at A and D, and we saw that they go to the next states, and we say, all right, well, they can be equivalent, they're definitely equivalent, but we said things like A and C may be equivalent if the case was that B is equivalent to D and A is equivalent to B as well. And this is the idea behind this algorithm. We will now write in each one of those squares what conditions needs to be fulfilled in order to get um, the two states that make the state pair equivalent to each other. So if I'm looking at A and C, for A and C to be equivalent, I do need B and D to be equivalent to each other. And I need A and B to be equivalent to each other as well. And only if these two conditions are fulfilled, then it could be, uh, then A and C will be equivalent. Did I say too many times equivalent? It's better than saying all the time zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one. Now, this algorithm, I do need to look through all the state pairs that are left. Um, A and D. So I'm looking at A and D. Now here, you have a choice, right? You can either say, well, this needs to say B and B are equivalent to each other. You can either write it out explicitly, so that's a B equivalent to B, N, A equal to A. I usually, in my notation, do write those things explicitly. Ex explicitly. Some people, when they do it, just omit anything that's obvious, like B equals to B, A equals to A. Don't bother writing it out and then just leaving this um, square blank. Um, you can, if you want, you don't have to. I like to write it out so every um, square has exactly two pairs in it. A and F, so we need B and A to be equivalent. And we need A and E to be equivalent as well. Now to finish this column here, A and G. So we need B and E to be equivalent. And A and G to be equivalent to each other. So far the idea is pretty clear. All right, so let me just fill up the rest of it, B and E. So we've got F and C and E and B. I'm comparing C and D. So I have D and B and A and B. If I make mistakes, please shout out. There was shout out, yeah? No, shout out. I can see how you might confuse the two. C and F. I need A and D, B and E, C and G, D and E and B and G, D and F, I need A and B, um, and A and E, D and G is B, E, B and A and G. And less one, F and G, so I've got A and E and E and G. And this is the first iteration that I have on this table. Now I have to go through the whole table and start seeing if anything contradicts each other. So I'm looking at to check whether A and C are equivalent to each other. And the conditions for A and C to be equivalent is that B and D are equivalent and that A and B are equivalent. And I check, can B be equal to D? And I go to B and D. And I see that it's been crossed out. 
meaning B and D are not equivalent. Therefore, A and C cannot be equivalent. And I will cross this one out as well. Now, B and B and A and A will always be equivalent. I'll leave it as it is. I check A and B. Can they be equivalent? I go A and B. Well, A and B has been crossed out. They're not equivalent. Therefore, this will be crossed out. When I look at A and G, I'm looking B and E. Can they be equivalent? Well, B and E, maybe. A and G, are they equivalent? Well, it's the thing itself, yet it hasn't been crossed out, it stays. And I am iterating through the whole table again, so in column B here. Can F and C be the same? Um, C and F, maybe. E and B, which is itself, which is not crossed out, could be, I'm leaving it out as it is. D and B, we said, could not be equivalent. This one goes. A and D, A and D is not crossed out. The other condition, B and E, not crossed out, maybe. D and E, D and E is crossed out, therefore this cannot be true. A and B is crossed out, therefore this cannot be true. B and E, B and E is a maybe. A and G, also a maybe. Leave it as it is. Last one, A and E, A and E is crossed out, therefore this crossed out as well. I'm not done yet, because what happened while I was crossing, crossing things out down here, I may have now contradicted one of the conditions that uh, weren't contradicted before. So I have to go through another iteration and check if there's anything cr contradicting now. I finish um, the checkups when there's no more crossouts to the table. So if I manage to go through the whole thing, not cross out a single square, that's when I stop. Well, B and B and A and A always equivalent to each other. B and E equivalent A and G may be equivalent we we'll leave it. F and C, F where C and F not crossed out. E and B not crossed out, that stays. A and D, A and D not crossed out. And B and E not crossed out, stays. B and E, we just said not crossed out. A and G not crossed out, it stays. And these are all crossed out. And this is when I stop the algorithm. There's no, no more cross out. I didn't cross anything new. And I can stop. Now, all those places that have not been crossed out, which are this one here, this one, and this one, implies imply state equivalency. So I can, by looking at this chart here, I can tell that A and D will be equivalent to each other. A and G will also be equivalent to each other. So I can just edit here. And in fact, you will see that D and G are equivalent to each other. And this is something that this algorithm will always um, produce. You will not get a contradiction if you had A is equivalent to D, A is equivalent to G, but D and G cannot be equivalent to each other, because that just doesn't make sense. And it will not happen with this um, algorithm. We can see that B and E are equivalent to each other. And C and F are equivalent to each other. And we already covered this one with the one at the top. So we know that we start with seven states and we finished with the United States. No, that's a bad joke. <laughs> it, actually, it actually happened to me a couple of years ago without noticing. People said, like, you know, what? Um, now once we can combine states together, we can start eliminating them. 
So instead of having three states for A, D, and G, we can have one state, um, we can call it A, for example, that will enclose within it both D and G. Similarly, state B can be equivalent uh, for both B and E. State C will enclose within it um, the old state C and the old state F. So if you remember, that was my original machine with the seven states. I now said I can combine the states together and I will call the new states A, B, and C. You can, if you want, by the way, take each group and give them a new name. You can call that K, L, and M if you want. Um, if, if calling them by the same state names confuses you, give them some new names. So we'll write, now I have those three, sorry, those three states, A, B, and C. Now what are they going to go to? I will go to the original state A, and I will say, well, originally it went to B output zero, and then to A output zero. I still have my A and B states, they didn't disappear, they didn't combine them with anything else. So I can just leave it as B zero and A zero. If you look at the original state B, it used to go to F and E. But F and E don't exist anymore. We combine them, well E went into B, F went into C, and therefore everywhere that I can see an F, I can write um, a C instead. Everywhere that it says an E, I'll write a B instead. So this will be B. The output will stay the same output. Um, instead of E, sorry, this was an with a C, he will have a B and a 1. Now the original C went to D, D is now really um, the new state A, so we'll go to A output 0 and to B, B still there, output 0. And this will be the same machine does this mean this one exactly? Now if you had, just one second, if you had um, descriptions for all these different states, essentially you unite the descriptions as well into the new machine. So if A was something happened, um, D something else happened, and G was something else happened, then this equivalent state A here will say, well the first thing happened or the second thing or the third thing. Usually, once you um, go from here to here, then you don't really need um, your English descriptions anymore um, because the English descriptions usually help us when we actually develop the machine. Once the machine is actually fully developed, there's no real meaning or there's no need for the English um, statements anymore. The other point that I want to make, the other point that I want to make is if in this table we ended up with um, a state that is not, um, that we cannot combine with any other state, then this state stays as it is and then when we, and then when we go from um, the original machine to the reduced machine, we have to copy this um, state across as it is. Yes, question? Yeah. If you had two variables, you need to do a couple of things. First of all, you need to check all the possible four um, outputs to begin with, and all four of them will have to match. The other thing is that now each one of those squares will now have four um, conditions that have to be fulfilled. So in a way, I mean, the, statistically it says it's becoming harder to actually match two um, states together, but you know, it might be able to. The algorithm is the same algorithm. Um, on the same note, by the way, as I said, this is working with um, milling machine. If you had a more machine and you had to do the same thing, minimize it, you only really, the, the difference in the state table would be that you still have the same, um, or you still have next states, but the outputs 
are, are going to have their own column that is associated with the state, all you have to do then is just compare in the first iteration um, any pair of outputs there. You won't have this whole thing across. So in a way, it's actually easier um, to compare more machines because there's only really one output in the first iteration. Um, all right. Um, questions about this? Okay. Yeah. So just a for C, how um, do you think, so it proves for the next state output, you're using from A, B, and C, right? So from so you know you need to go across state, so you're only using A, B, and C, right? Yeah. And then your next stage you only got you because you're only using the A, B, and C as well. You know yeah, you yeah. Um, because these this, this is a new machine now. It only has three states. Right. There's no other states it can go to. If you drew this thing up, it would only have you know three circles in it. Um, and these will sort of have some um, transitions between them. Okay. Yeah? Um, as I said, it's a fairly easy algorithm once you sort of understand how to go about doing this. A little bit lengthy, um, but you know, once you get the idea, you're just writing out some stuff. Now let's take 10 minutes break. Um, please don't make it more than 10 minutes because I do have some more stuff I want to show you today.